Bilige is attached to the Department of Psychiatry of the Faculty of Medicine of General Sir John Kodalawala Defence University as a senior lecturer and a consultant psychiatrist at University Hospital Kodalawala Defence University. Dr. Naina Fernando is a senior lecturer in community medicine at General Sir John Kodalawala Defence University and a community physician at University Hospital Kotalawale Defense University. This session will be judged by Vidya Jyoti Asita De Silva, Senior Professor of Pharmacology, Faculty of Medicine, University of Kalaniya, Sri Lanka, and Professor Arya Rani Nadadasan, Senior Professor in Clinical Medicine, Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo and presently serving at the Department of Paraclinical Sciences, General Sir John Kotalawala Defence University during her sabbatical leave. We are honoured to have two eminent academics of Sri Lanka to judge this session. I cordially invite Dr. Indika Mudalige and Dr. Nayana Fernando to commence this session. Okay, uh, thank you very much. So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. On behalf of the General Surgeon Kotala Defense University, so I want to welcome all of you to the 14th International Research Conference on the theme of security, stability, and national development in the new normal. So, I think uh, uh, we don't have to, I think we don't have to uh, give much more details about our judge panel. So, all of you know them. Uh, and uh, so let me to thank our judge panel, uh, the Senior Professor of uh, Pharmacology, Vidya Jyoti Professor Asta Di Silla. Thank you very much, sir, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. And uh, Professor of uh, Clinical Medicine, Professor Christine Arirani uh, Nyanathasan. Thank you very much, madam, for joining with us today. Uh, so, uh, and also that uh, let me to have this uh, time to thank in the participants, the presentation, presentators for giving your valuable uh, presentations and research evidence for the uh, present uh, presentations. Uh, so let me to tell you a few uh, ground rules here. And uh, yeah, actually, please keep uh, all the mics mute and raise hands during the session if, the, if you want uh, uh, any questions and type in the chat box any questions you want to ask. And uh, it's better to have the Q and A sessions after the each uh, presentations. So um, over to you, Naina. Hello. You are muted. You are muted. Unmute yourself. I'm really sorry. Thank you very much. And uh, without wasting much time, we'll move on to the first presentation. It's on prevalence of home accidents among children aged one to four years and its association of knowledge, attitude, and first aid practices of mothers in Sri Lanka. Uh, the presentation will be presented by uh, a. Balasurya and uh, the other author is U. C. Gangwadu. Over to you, Balasurya sir. Good afternoon. Uh, this study I will be presenting uh, is uh, a study done by my supervisor, Dr. Tupuli uh, Samari Gamadavila, uh, District Medical Officer, District Hospital Padukka. And uh, the title is Prevalence of Home Accidents Among Children Aged 1 to 4 Years and Its Association with Knowledge, Attitudes, and First Aid Practices Following Home Accidents of Their Mothers in an area in Sri Lanka. 
in sri lanka the number one reason for hospital admissions is traumatic injuries for the past so many years injuries can be intentional or unintentional and the latter are categorized according to place of injury injuries account for 1 in 10 deaths and 1 in 7 disability worldwide in addition to hospital admission <clears throat> even way back in 2009 there were 800 There were eight hundred and seventy-five thousand deaths of under eighteen years old around the world. Deaths due to injuries ranked fifth in South Asia, Southeast Asia, but was ranked tenth in Sri Lanka. <clears throat> Maybe due to better accessibility to health institutions in Sri Lanka. According to latest available national figures of two thousand eighteen. There were seventy-one thousand one hundred and ninety-five children aged one to four years admitted to hospitals with injuries, which was six point three percent of all admissions due to injuries. These figures were one hundred and eighty-four thousand two hundred and three, and sixteen point three percent for children between five to sixteen years. Home accidents come under place of injury. Which is important, especially regarding small children. They have increased risk of death and disability from accidents. Therefore, first aid is an important uh, first aid is important to minimize death and disability. As you know, first aid is immediate help provided to a sick or injured person until professional help is given. and can be for physical injury or illness or even it can be psychological support which is called psychological first aid the concept promoted by the mental health directorate of the ministry of health so this study was done with the objective to assess the prevalence of home accidents among children aged 1 to 4 years and its association with knowledge that the bad first aid practices of the mothers following home accidents in the medical office of health area of Kolkata this was a community based descriptive cross sectional study using an interview administered questionnaire conducted in 2016 probability proportionate to size cluster sampling was used to get the sample of 240 with 10% non response and 1.5 cluster effect added to the calculated 206 17 public health midwife areas out of 29 were the selected clusters ethics approval was from the faculty of medicine university of kalambo and permissions were obtained from the provincial director of health services western province regional director of health services kalutara and the medical officer of health bulat singhal four trained data collectors administered questionnaires After obtaining voluntary informed written consent from the mothers, the questionnaire had sections of on demographic data, prevalence of home accidents during the past three months, and uh, first aid practices, knowledge, and attitude on first aid. We considered the home accidents such as falls, heart injuries. burns and scalds due to maybe hot water maybe acids and things like that then uh, animal bites which included cats and dogs snake bites scorpion and centipede stings insect stings then poisoning choking and drowning the 70% cut off was used to say good knowledge and good attitude attitude while individual practices are expressed as percentages first we asked whether there was uh, an accident recently and if they said yes only we asked what they practiced then only we asked the knowledge questions otherwise it could uh, influence the practice questions 
So we first asked about the practice, then we asked about the knowledge. So this is the summary of results and the details will follow. The response rate was 90.1%. The valence of farm accidents within the previous three months was 53.7% with the 95 confidence interval from 47.6 to 59.3. Okay. All the mothers of children had good attitudes, that is over 75% regarding first aid. Overall good knowledge was poor, only 40.3%. And was significantly associated only with the recent history of an animal bite. So, for individual types of farm accident, we can see the prevalence. The commonest was falls, then cut injuries, then animal bites. But here we have separated the animal bites into uh, different types of animal. So this is the prevalence of farm accidents. With regard to the level of first aid knowledge, the knowledge on falls, drowning and choking was good. But overall knowledge was only seen in 40.3% of the mothers. So as I told earlier, the knowledge questions were asked from all the mothers, but the practice questions were asked from only those who had a recent history. When we look at specific first aid practices, 87 mothers out of 110 who experienced falls of their children, that is 79.1%, had talked to the child to assess alertness and confusion and only 11% had immobilized with Rosalyn. With burns, 94% had rinsed with running water, and with cuts, all had washed with clean water. All the mothers who experienced poisoning had taken the container to the hospital. Only 55.6% had given the timely maneuver to the child after the accident. So these are the other practices we looked at. Out of these practices, puncturing blisters after burns and giving water after choking are wrong practices. So luckily, only a few number has done those, had those practices. The prevalence of home accidents of 53.7% from our study is higher than that in 2007 in Dharma study. Also higher than the study uh, which was done in urban Poland now. So maybe because our study was in Bulat Singhala, which is a mainly rural area. Prevalence from other countries also were of a similar Trend, rural areas had higher percentage, urban and suburban areas had less number of home accidents. Falls, which was the highest seen among 35.6%, was uh, similar to that in Egypt. <clears throat> With regard to knowledge, it was comparatively poor in relation to other similar studies, Sri Lanka and elsewhere. Maybe because this was in a rural area. The attitudes, as I said, on first aid was good. And uh, some of the other practices were also comparatively good. The good attitudes of the participants is good for our recommendations. Yeah, we re recommend implementing training programs on first aid from others. So they will come for those training programs. These are the other recommendations. So we had few limitations and we have not covered some of the areas. 
hindi sa our preferences. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Balasuria. Now uh, the session is open for discussion. Professor Balasuria. Yes, sir. And uh, when we were medical students long time ago, and among the rural children, there were two types of injuries. I'm referring to Sri Lanka. One is bottle lamp injuries, toppling of the kerosene oil bottle lamp because a fair number of little children were affected. And also the uh, exposure to chemicals because various chemicals, insecticides, pesticides were there in the rural setup. So according to your survey, all these injuries have disappeared. I think we have to be very pleased about it or what is the outcome. Even, even exploration of electricity by small kids, putting their fingers into plugs and all that. These are reported injuries. So in your series, have you found those injuries? So, uh, in our study, uh, burns uh, were reported by 16 of the, the children, uh, mothers of the children, that is 5.2%. So these uh, burns uh, included the, the kerosene oil lamp burns and uh, uh, acid burns, especially with uh, 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 acid burns in an area of uh, air, uh, air in Bullock signal area where the uh, uh, this uh, tapping of uh, rubber is there. Yeah. Uh, this acetic acid is available yeah. in the homes. But as you said, sir, uh, even uh, the uh, kerosene oil lamp burns were only very, very low, only in 5% uh, of the the population. As we know, uh, uh, Sri Lanka uh, is uh, proud of that uh, special uh, kerosene oil lamps project. So they have come down drastically. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ayendra, how did you uh decide whether the mother's knowledge was good or bad what is the criterion that you used yeah for the for the knowledge uh, we looked at similar studies and uh, for each type of uh, home accident we asked a set of questions uh, between 5 to be, between 5 to 9 questions for each type of injury uh, home accident and uh, if the answer was the correct answer we gave one mark if the answer was incorrect uh, we didn't give marks and then uh, uh, we considered 70 percent as uh, good knowledge okay so you did it fairly objectively yes sir Is there a particular reason you selected this A group rather than selecting the high A group? Uh, the, the reason was, uh, now if the, uh, we wanted to look at mainly the, the knowledge and practices of the, the mothers. If we took a, a high age group, uh, it would, uh, uh, we would have to then assess the knowledge of the, the children also because they are some uh, higher age. So that's why we selected this one, uh, this age group. And the other reason was the, the uh, sample was fairly accessible because uh, we used the, the births and immunization register of all the midwives in the area and selected the sample. And also the uh, children were at home. So uh, uh, we could ensure that uh, we can collect data easily. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So, any other questions? 
Okay, in the absence of uh, further questions, we'll move on to the second presentation. That is, attitude on COVID-19 among healthcare workers in selected hospitals in Sri Lanka by MMPT Jayasekar, AU Gamage, and RBA Senaviratna. And the presenting author is uh, MMPT Jayasekar. Good afternoon, everyone. My research topic is Attitudes on COVID-19 among healthcare workers in selected hospitals in Sri Lanka. Healthcare workers are frontline workers who come in direct contact with the patients and put themselves at risk of being exposed. A positive attitude towards COVID-19 safeguards healthcare workers and delivers better care for COVID-19 patients. So our objective was to assess the attitudes on COVID-19 among healthcare workers in Sri Lanka. Methods, a descriptive cross-sectional study was conducted from June to September 2020. A curative healthcare institution was considered a cluster. The study consists of three categories of hospitals, which are COVID treatment centers, COVID isolation centers, and other centers. These were defined as the first wave of COVID pandemic in Sri Lanka by Ministry of Health. Permanent staff doctors and nurses who had more than two years of experience participated in the study. Distribution of 12 hospitals in Sri Lanka. So treatment centers were base hospital Mulledyava, base hospital Homagama, Valikanda COVID treatment center, University Hospital KDU. Isolation centers were teaching hospital Jaffna, teaching hospital Ratnapura, teaching hospital Kurnagala, provincial general hospital Badulla. Other hospitals, district general hospital Trincomalee, base hospital Tangol, base hospital Varakapula, and base hospital Matale. You can see the distribution among the Sri Lanka. We have represented almost all part of the country and it, it almost covering the uh, whole Sri Lanka. So our study tool, it was a self-administered questionnaire with 15 attitude questions. They were answered on five point Likert scale with the options to strongly disagree, disagree, neither agree nor disagree, agree and strongly agree. Each was scored, four marks were given for strongly agreed with a positive item or strongly disagreed with a negative item. Three marks were given for agreeing with a positive or disagreeing with a negative item. One was given agreeing with negative item or disagreeing with a positive item. Strongly agreeing with the negative item or strongly disagreeing with the positive item were marked zero. Neither agree nor disagree was also given zero. The total possible score was 60 and minimum was zero. We sum the marks obtained from each attitude question and the mean score was considered as a cutoff. So the cutoff we got was 46 or above that. And data analysis was performed using SPSS version 21. Results, there were total participants of 651, which was 90.4% of what we have expected. And in COVID-19 treatment centers, the 224, COVID-19 isolation centers, 226, and non-COVID hospitals, 201, more or less equal. So if you look at the gender, there were 202 males and 433 females, more females than males. And there were 315 doctors and 336 nurses. Out of that, 498, that means 76.5% were married. So the mean age was of 44.3 years, a majority like 310 of uh, participants were between 30 to 39 years of age. About 60% had a bachelor, master or a doctoral degree and the remainder had diplomas. 440 had children while 143 had family members above the age of 60 years and with chronic illnesses. 
So we look at the attitude data. So 50% of the participants had positive attitude towards COVID-19 patients. Their mean score was above 46. Nearly half the participants worried that they would be exposed to COVID-19 infection, they would be infected with COVID-19 if exposed, and they were not adequately protected even when wearing masks. If you look at this graph, you can see the fourth column, uh, the green bar uh, showing, showing I worry that I will be exposed to COVID-19 infection. And the orange bar shows I have fears that if I am exposed to a COVID-19 patient that I will be infected. So majority agree with that. 50% worried that there was no specific treatment. 52.2 agreed and 15.9 strongly agreed that they would feel more protected if they were provided with N95 masks and other protective equipments. And look at this graph. So they say, I do not feel adequately protected by wearing masks. So if you see the fourth column again, the blue column is saying that, and I feel that even if we do not have COVID-19 cases, I should be given a N95 mask, but not the, the other one, the, uh, several people also disagreed with that also. If I am provided with N95 mask and other protection, I feel safe. For that, most majority agree and some strongly agree. So they think if they are much comfortable when they were given protected, uh, protective equipments. So the, when we consider care for COVID patients, 75% of participants disagreed on providing minimum care to COVID-19 patients. 51.5 were not worried that they had to treat COVID-19 patients. That is actually a good attitude. Sixty percent of participants agreed that they would not worry much on be being exposed if the vaccine was available. By the time when we did the study, there was no clue for vaccine. More than half of them were worried about being quarantined following exposure to COVID-19 patients. 86.1 believe it was important to quarantine the exposed close contact of a COVID-19 patients. Nearly 60% worried that they are at a higher risk of being exposed to COVID-19 as healthcare workers. So considering the profession, being a doctor is associated with positive attitude. And in different centers, I think you may remember we have taken treatment centers, isolation centers, and other hospitals. There's no significant difference in attitude among three different centers. So in conclusion, 50% of participants showed satisfactory attitude towards COVID-19. Still, they believe they should be provided N95 masks and protective equipment, even in unsuspected patients' care. So our recommendations, it is important to develop positive attitude among all healthcare workers. Ministry of Health should pay attention to attitude development with psychological support for their workers, which will reduce the psychological stress, improve the patient care, and help in mitigating the pandemic. So I would like to acknowledge National Research Council for providing research grant, consultant physician at all 12 hospitals who enormously help to collect data, and to proceed with my study, all the participants and medical officers who helped in data collection. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Priyamali, for your interesting presentation. And uh, it's time for discussion. Priyamali, how did you decide that a particular attitude was considered positive or not? Who provided the benchmark? For example, you are saying that a person who was concerned about uh, treating patients with an inferior kind of mask, that, that seems you are going to rate him low on attitude. How, who made the judgment? How, how did you define the positive attitude regarding any of these criteria? So because was, uh, <laughs> it was pre tested with uh, 20 healthcare workers in, uh, in a hospital, 
and depending on their marks, um, like they are, how do how did they mark? Depending on that, we decided whether this point should be taken as positive or negative. Oh, who were the twenty that provided the benchmark? How did you select that twenty? So they they were just randomly selected the doctors and nurses. In the Gampa hospital, but because they were not in the study, that hospital is not taken into the study. Otherwise, we can't, as you said, we can't accept. I think you know there, there is an essential theoretical weakness in studies like this because attitude, you know, especially defining attitude, what is good or not, is a highly subjective thing. For me, a person who displays an attitude of you know being cautious and not prone to expose, that is to me a positive attitude and not a negative attitude. You know what I mean? You don't like that. You see, so would you would you expect a person who said, even if I'm not given any PPE, I'm prepared to treat the patient, that is a positive attitude, is it? Actually saying it's a positive attitude, but we can't expect people to say like mm -hmm. so because of that, sir, we pre-tested 20, 20 actually 20 people in Gampa Hospital, then on that basis mm -hmm. we decided this is positive or this is negative. Thank you. And uh, you are. Dr. Premani, shall I answer? Uh, um, uh, Narada, sir, I'm also one of the authors. I'm Anoji here. Uh, so, yes, we pre tested and also the uh, benchmark, like it's it was very subject. I agree with you, sir. It is subjective. Plus, how we cut, took the cutoff was we took the mode. If okay. that is your, if, if that's the answer to your question. So a majority of people in that kind of setup think that this is a good attitude. That is what uh, you're saying. Yes, that's sir. Because uh, this was a, like a scale that we use. We thought the mode would suit better. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Now, oh, anyhow, your attempt has been highly praiseworthy because it's a difficult area to evaluate because uh, it's a, it's a uh, one, those attitudes cannot be uh, quantified. But anyhow, it's a good attempt. I would like to ask you a very special yeah. question. What about their preferences for various vaccines? Shall I say vaccine A, B, C, or D? Was there any additional demand for a particular? I mean, that is also a very important attitude among the workers. So this was done like the, the start of the first wave. So those that yeah. had there were no vaccines available. Yeah, all right. Thank and you. By the time they would have to have any vaccine. There was a question like whether you like to have vaccine. Most of them agreed, but uh, there was no response. Okay. And uh, thank you, Priyamal, for taking this uh, subject into your research because I myself face so much of problem with human resources in the hospital because of their negative attitudes on uh, COVID-19. Most of the time, they a uh, lot of uh, absenteeism and... Uh, they refuse to work in several areas. So I think you should continue this work and uh, uh, explore more deep areas of these uh, attitudes on COVID-19. Thank you, Premal. Thank you, Ramal. Any other questions? So in the absence of more questions, we'll move on to the next presentation. Knowledge and attitudes regarding human immunodeficiency virus and their associated factors among adult patients attending outpatient department in Kalambu South Teaching Hospital by MUW Gunaratna, DAVYV Gunavardhana, SM Jeevaratna, YW Kodikara, HS Munasinha, B. Fernando Pulle, and CSE Gunardana. The presenting author is HS Munasinha. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so, I would like to thank the organizing committee for giving us the opportunity to present our undergraduate research titled Knowledge and Attitudes Regarding Human Immune Deficiency Virus and the associated factors among adult patients attending outpatient department in Kalam South Teaching Hospital. Uh, so HIV is a well-known public health issue. 
And although the number of patients living with HIV in Sri Lanka are as low as 3,700, the number infected yearly is increasing. Uh, it may be due to the uh, high risk behaviors of, uh, in the at-risk population due to their poor knowledge on disease transmission, prevention, and the treatment modalities, or it may be due to the strong social stigma prevalent within the society, uh, causing the patients to not disclose their HIV status and further propagating the disease. So in a setting like this, it's essential to assess the knowledge and the attitudes that the people have towards the disease so as to improve the quality of life uh, for both the patient as well as the society. So the main objective of our study was this, that is to determine the knowledge and the attitudes uh, towards the disease and also to determine the associated factors. Uh, so for the study, we chose the outpatient department of Columbus South Teaching Hospital and the study was carried out as a descriptive cross-sectional study in the period of June 2018 to November 2019. All the adult patients aged 18 to 45 were uh, chosen for the study, uh, except those who were acutely ill and those who were not mentally sound. So this is how we calculate the sample size and the final sample size was taken to be 402. And the respondents were chosen by a systematic sampling technique. So we use the interview administered questionnaire, which comprised of four sections, where in section one, we collected all the demographic details of the patient. And uh, in section two, we assess the knowledge of the respondent using a set of 23 questions. And in section three, we assess the attitudes of the uh, respondents using a set of 12 questions. And finally, we collected the sources of information. Uh, the questionnaire was pre-tested in 10 factory workers at Piliandala and later several alterations were done. And before the data collection, we obtained administrative clearance from the director of uh, Kalaburila South Asian Hospital as well as the NYC of the OPB. So for the analysis part, we used a scoring system. Uh, in uh, analysis of the knowledge, one mark was given for each correct response and zero marks for an incorrect response. So uh, a total out of 23 uh, uh, were, was given for the uh, as a total score. And uh, after the mean score was calculated, all the scores that were above the mean score were labeled as having good knowledge, while those below the uh, mean score were labeled as having poor knowledge. So the same was done for attitudes, where those uh, scores which were above the average score were to, uh, labeled as having positive attitudes, those which were below were labeled as having negative attitudes. We also studied the associated factors between knowledge as well as attitudes. For all these, we use the latest version of the SPSS and the significance level was taken to be less than 0.05. Uh, so after we got the ethical approval from the university as well as the uh, uh, hospital research councils, we ensured that the anonymity of our respondents is preserved by giving them an index number. Uh, before recruiting them to the study, we explained what this study was and we gave them uh, a chance to ask us questions so as to clarify their doubt as well. After the end of the study, we gave them a leaflet so that they could uh, confirm their knowledge and uh, about the disease uh, and uh, clarify all their doubts that they had about the disease. Uh, uh, so coming to the data analysis, uh, when the social demographic and economic characteristics were analyzed, we saw that more than half of the respondents were females and uh, at least one third belonged to the young age category of 18 to 27. More than half were married, and we could see that more than three fourths of the population were Sinhala Buddhists. And it's noteworthy that more than half of the respondents had at least educational level of either O level or A level. When analyzing the knowledge, as I told earlier, uh, the mean knowledge was 13.52, and we could see that the cohort, uh, majority of the cohort, more than 50%, that is 52.5%, had good knowledge. So uh, when analyzing the attitudes, uh, you can see that most of the respondents showed uh, negative attitudes. And it's noteworthy in questions five, six, and seven, more than three fourths of the, uh, of the respondents admitted to the fact that they would be ashamed if they had, if they or a family member was infected with HIV, they would be ashamed. So, uh, uh, therefore, uh, which reflects the strong social stigma which is prevalent in the society. Although contradictory positive attitudes were shown uh, by more than half of the respondents uh, saying that they wouldn't discriminate uh, people with HIV. 
and uh, it's also interesting to see that more than half of the population were not scared of caring for a family member who has HIV AIDS. So uh, when analyzing the sources of information, we could see that the most popular source of information was the television followed by internet and the newspapers. And uh, uh, we should note here that only one third of the respondents had gathered their knowledge through medical professionals. So uh, when analyzing the associated factors uh, uh, between knowledge, we could see that age, marital status, and the educational level were proven to be significant. Again, uh, to be precise, the younger age, uh, the unmarried group, and the above all level categories were uh, shown, shown to be uh, significantly associated with good knowledge. So the same three factors, that is younger age, being unmarried, and having above all level as educational qualification were shown, shown to be significantly associated with more positive attitudes as well. Uh, so the findings of our study was uh, compatible with what we found in the literature where uh, most of our, for an example, most of our study population had good knowledge and uh, similar studies in Sri Lanka as well as in China uh, found out, uh, found out uh, to be uh, their population to be having good knowledge about HIV. And similarly, uh, uh, in our study as well, the most uh, popular uh, source of information was the TV and the internet, uh, which was also found in other studies. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to see that in our study also, which revealed a strong uh, negative attitude that the people had towards uh, HIV, it was also shown in studies uh, in Sri Lanka as well as in Saudi Arabia, which shows that the stigma is borderless and the issues associated with it should be addressed so as to solve all the problems arising from it. Um, also, the uh, major majority of our respondents uh, showed positive attitudes towards caring for a family member with HIV, which was also shown in similar studies carried out in Sri Lanka, which may be because of the strong family bond associated with our culture. So younger participants uh, were shown to be significantly associated with good knowledge, which may be uh, due to the increased availability of social media uh, and uh, the availability of platforms where they could uh, discuss openly about sensitive topics uh, like HIV. And also it may be due to the incorporation of sexually transmitted diseases uh, into the health education curriculum, causing them to gain more knowledge. Um, it's also noteworthy here that uh, all the significant factors that we got for good knowledge were also significant for having more positive attitudes as well. So therefore, we can say that by giving good knowledge to the people, we can inculcate more positive attitudes in them as well. So finally, all in all, as a conclusion, we saw that the majority of the population had good knowledge and uh, younger age participants, unmarried people, and those with a higher educational level had uh, good knowledge as well as more positive attitudes. And only one third of the participants had got the knowledge about the disease through medical professionals, which could be addressed in the future, where medical professionals could play a more active role in uh, distributing, uh, giving uh, information to the people. And also we could incorporate uh, the more popular me media methods like the TV and the internet to uh, give out uh, health education programs targeting different uh, age groups. And also we must make sure that the knowledge about the disease is uh, improved so that more positive attitudes can be inculcated in them regarding the disease. So uh, these were the references that we used. And we would finally like to thank all the patients who participated in our research. And thank you. Thank you, Dr. Munasinga, for your interesting presentation. Now the audience can ask questions. Uh did you say that you excluded people who could not converse in Sinhalese? I, in your methodology, I saw something like that. Uh, yes, sir. We uh, only considered uh, those who spoke Sinhala and uh, Tamil, sir. Uh, uh, Sinhala and Tamil? Uh, sir. You, you included? Sinhala, Sinhala. Sorry, sir. Sinhala. 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 Ah, okay. I, I must say, you know, that I think... Uh, I would consider that unacceptable in a methodology in a Sri Lankan study. 
but otherwise you did an extremely good study. Any other questions to be asked? Okay, in the absence of further questions, uh, we'll move on to the next topic. That is parental stress, economic burden and associated factors among parents of thalassemia patients in Kurunagala District, Sri Lanka by UC Jaisekar, C. Vijay Sundara and K. O. Pandar Nayaka. And the presentation will be done by UC Jaisekar. Good day to all the panel members and all listeners. I am Upekka Chintani Jasekara. My topic is Parental Stress, Economic Burden and its Associated Factors Among Parents of Thalassemia Patients in Sri Lanka. First, I am moving to the introduction. Thalassemia is an inherited blood disorder where it causes a mutation in globin gene. Uh, this is an important health issue in Sri Lanka. We do have about 3,000 patients in Sri Lanka, but we find the highest cases in Kurunagara district. You can see, you can see the uh, map uh, given in the right-hand side. Um, it indicates how the treatment centers are localized throughout the country. When uh, we are dis discussing furthermore, thalassemia has two types. One is thalassemia minor, the other one is thalassemia major. Uh, the treatments are more or less considering with the thalassemia major patients as they are the one uh, who are with the clinical symptoms. Uh, so when we are talking about the treatments, we do have uh, two types. One is uh, the uh, one is blood transfusion, and the other one is iron chelation therapy. Uh, so the pathetic situation is uh, the guardian or the parent of this particular patient are spending the patients are spending their time and money because of this uh, because of this disease condition. Uh, and when we are talking about the uh, parental stress-related thalassemia, uh, the stress on guardian or the parent can cause issues as like uh, family problems, uh, broken marriages and stigmatizations as well in the society. But however, when we consider the level of stress related to any chronic disease, uh, the number of uh, literature is available in Sri Lanka is very less. And when it comes to thalassemia, the number of literature available in Sri Lanka is very, very less. Uh, so to justify my study in Sri Lanka, no accessible literature is available on parental stress in patients of thalassemia patients. Uh, so actually we conducted this study in Kurunagala uh, Hospital because there are about 1000 patients are, uh, who are being treated currently, uh, which is known as the National Thalassemia Center in Sri Lanka. And in this center, a lot of treatments are undergone and the patients from the Kurunagala district districts and patients from the other districts as well are getting their treatments in this uh, treatment center. Now I'm moving to the objectives. My general objective is to assess parental stress, economic burden and its associated factors among parents of thalassemia patients admitted to the National Thalassemia Center in Kurunagala. Uh, in this slide, uh, the specific objectives are also given, but now I'm moving to the materials and methods. This was conducted as a hospital-based cross, uh, descriptive cross-sectional study where it was conducted in National Thalassemia Unit in Kurnagala Teaching Hospital by using the parent, parent, parents of uh, patients who are admitted to the hospital and we collected uh, we conducted this study for about 10 months uh, and the sample calculation we did using the Levenga and Lamshok equation uh, where we used the proportion, the pre prevalence as 50%. Ultimately, it came to a total number of 422, but due to the logical con constraints, we only couldn't, could obtain uh, 145 sample size. So when we collect, uh, 
when we collected samples, uh, we used the consecutive sampling technique and we did a uh, pre-tested pre interview administer questionnaire. And uh, you know, in the questionnaire, we collected the factors uh, of parents and patients' social demography and uh, economic status and the clinical information uh, about the disease condition. And uh, to assess the stress score, we used the Berry and Jones stress score. However, we used it in inverse. And after collecting the data, we entered the data in the Excel sheet and exported it into IBM SPSS uh, statistical software. And uh, we did a uh, descriptive st uh, statistics to describe the socio demographic factors and uh, other factors as well. And then we used t-test to analyze the relationships between the factors and the stress level. The, and the ethical clearance was obtained from the ERC of National Institute of Health Science. So now we will move on to the results and discussion. Um, throughout the uh, study population, um, 86.9% were female, 65.5% uh, were uh, less than 40 years or 40 years, more than 90% were Buddhists, more than 50% were in Kurnagara district, and when considering the uh, educational level, 93.8 had secondary education or an educational level upper than secondary education. And uh, when we are further discussing about the traveling and uh, daily expenditure, 77.2% uh, uh, used public buses as their transportation, whereas 35% uh, had, had taken 10 minutes to one hour to travel to the hospital, as well as 53.1% spent 2,000 uh, to 4,000 uh, uh, LKRs uh, for the ex daily expenses uh, during the hospitalization. And when we consider the stress score throughout the study sample, 55.2 was stressed uh, and uh, the stress range came uh, in between uh, to, uh, 32 to 79, whereas the mean came as 56.6. And uh, uh, as I previously uh, uh, described, we assessed the associations between social demographic factors and other economic related factors with stress score. So the characters which are given here, the level of confidence uh, is considered less than 0 0.05. Or five P level, and when considering the factors, uh, the factors which was which were significantly associated were the age below forty years, education of secondary or below, uh, the education of spouse of uh, tertiary or above, if uh, they have more than one thalassemia patients in home, if they undergo two blood transfusion for per one month, if they are having other complications, uh, having other complications rather than uh, thalassemia, if the monthly income uh, was less than to uh, 25,000 LKR and uh, if uh, the hospital expenses were uh, more than 1,000 rupees. And now I'm going to uh, compare uh, the, uh, our findings with other existing literature. So uh, when we compare, uh, we didn't find the gender being significant in our study and similar relationship was found in Africa in 2015. For the age significance, we found uh, similar studies as well as contradictory studies. For education, we found significantly associated with other studies in Malaysia and Pakistan and Picard et al. Uh, has described that if they have more than one thalassemia patient in their home, uh, the patient are, the parents are more prone to be stressed. In our uh, study also, we uh, found the same thing as well. And further discussing higher number of blood transfusion per month, complications of the transfusion, and higher expenses uh, throughout the hospitalization were also uh, significantly associated but we didn't found uh, we didn't find any similar uh, factors in other existing literature 
Uh, so if we consider only this situation, uh, the treatment centers in Sri Lanka are very well local, localized. So uh, the patient and the parent both have to travel furthermore to seek uh, medi medical help and treatments. Uh, because of this, uh, the economic burden can be increased. So uh, we think the, this economic burden is the uh, reason why these factors were significantly associated in this study. Finally, in my conclusion, um, during the study, uh, more than half of the uh, respondents were stressed. Uh, the, the several economic factors were significantly associated with the high stress level and uh, ones who were with low economical background were more prone to be stressed. Uh, and therefore we urge uh, that interventions should be developed to mitigate the economical and uh, social distress. And also I would like to recommend uh, counseling programs should be uh, developed to uh, to reduce the uh, psychological burden. These are my references. Authors wish to thank all the volunteers who have participated in this research and thank you for listening. Thank you very much for your presentation. So uh, now it's open for questions and discussion. You know, your <laughs> scale that you used uh, was a Western one. Is that culturally relevant? The parental stress core scale, is that culturally relevant to our context? Is that, has it been validated? So we found that several studies uh, in Asian countries also uh, used this. Uh, so that's why we use this actually. Other thing is I, I found it intriguing that uh, high education over tertiary in the spouse caused additional stress. Yes. Can you explain that? Uh, so sometimes uh, it, sometimes uh, the the parent or the guardian and the uh, spouse, they have a difference in educational level. So that might be the cause of uh, the, uh, that thing because uh, they are like, uh, they are... Uh, yeah, perceptions are yeah, different. Perce perceptions are, uh, perceptions uh, differ. That's, that might be the case. Uh, so it is not the actual level of education. What you are telling is the disparity between the spouses in educational level increases stress. Uh, yeah, that might be, sir. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, in the absence of further questions, uh, we'll move on to the next presentation on knowledge on HIV AIDS and attitudes towards people living with HIV AIDS among healthcare workers at District General Hospital Kalutara. Uh, conducted by LTDS Amaratunga, SAC Dalpadadu, WASS Bandara, MRDP Bandara, MHM Amjad, M. Arish, DS Ari Singh, PAR Adegunwardana, S. Abdullah, and A. Balasuri. <laughs> Presenter is LTDS Amaratunga. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Lakit Samaratunga, the principal author of a study titled Knowledge on HIV AIDS and Attitude Towards People Living with HIV and AIDS Among Healthcare Workers at District General Hospital Kalutara. I would like to thank the IRC Committee and the Faculty of Medicine of General Sir John Kutalavra Defense University for providing me with this opportunity to present at this conference. 
The study was supervised by Dr. Amali Dal Patadu and Professor Aindra Dal Balsuri. Let us start off by looking at the history and the current status of HIV and AIDS in Sri Lanka. The first HIV case was reported in 1987, and since then, there have been a gradual increase in the number of annual cases with 363 new cases in 2020. Despite this, Sri Lanka is said to have a low HIV prevalence. In fact, one of the lowest in South Asia. We were also able to reach an important milestone in eliminating mother to child transmission in 2019. HIV and AIDS is now a disease with greatly reduced morbidity and mortality rates compared to the past, owing to the advancements in diagnostic tests and antiretroviral therapy. However, there is a problem that we tend to neglect and underestimate, which could have drastic effects on the HIV status in Sri Lanka. That is the existence of stigma and discrimination towards HIV patients within the healthcare setting. Let's break it down into more <laughs> There is misinformation about the disease that leads to irrational fear and denial within healthcare workers. This then causes negative attitudes to be shown towards HIV patients in the form of stigma and discrimination. This then results in HIV patients undergoing lesser voluntary testing, not disclosing their HIV status, and to an extent to even refuse treatment. Ultimately, this leads to a latent epidemic of HIV being produced in the community. This is of major public health concern as we will not be aware of the cases prevalent in the community. Given the scope of this problem, it is important to know the 1990-90 targets, which are a set of goals that were required to be achieved by 2020, where 90% of patients were to know their HIV status, out of which 90% were to be started on antiretroviral therapy, and out of which 90% were to be virally suppressed. However, at the end of 2020, only 70% knew their HIV status and only 83% were started on treatment, making the only target achieved to be 91% being virally suppressed. Hence, we see a clear lack in diagnosis and subsequent treatment, and with the potential of a latent epidemic, this has become a paramount problem. Common findings in the literature, both locally and internationally, show some of these findings. The relationship of knowledge and profession with stigma and discrimination, Discrimination shown through various ways, both verbally and physically, as well as common misconceptions about the disease, especially being a punishment or promiscuous behavior. Our general objective was to assess the knowledge on HIV and AIDS and the levels of stigma and discrimination shown by healthcare workers towards people living with HIV and AIDS. Breaking this down into four specific objectives, they were to assess the knowledge healthcare workers had about the disease, to assess the level of stigma they had towards HIV patients, to assess the level of discrimination they portrayed, and finally, find any positive drivers for both stigma and discrimination. Our study was a descriptive cross-section study done at the General Medical and General Surgical Wards at District General Hospital Kalutere. We included these professions of doctors as well as nurses and mine staff while excluding consultants. Our sampling method consisted of recruiting all healthcare workers belonging to the inclusion criteria on the day of data collection. We use self-administered questionnaires to collect data which were made using referring to both current literature as well as tailor-made questions to better fit to the context of Sri Lankan culture. It was pre-tested for validation before collecting data. It had these independent variables and the dependent variables were knowledge, stigma, actions for discrimination, and the reasons for such actions. So these were the three main variables assessed, knowledge, stigma, and discrimination. Knowledge was tested regarding both on the disease as well as on the general ward practices that should be followed when treating for HIV patients. Stigma was assessed by the attitudes towards patients as well as more specifically in a ward setting. Discrimination was assessed by using a checklist of actions they would practice in the presence of an HIV patient. Data was assessed using SPSS version 26 and descriptive statistics used to tabulate data. And finally, hypotheses were made and tested using chi score tests to check for significance, using a probability of less than 0.05 at a 95% confidence interval. So these were our results. There was a response rate of 95.8%, and majority of them belonged to the profession of nurses, the total of 45, and 75 of the participants were female. Most of the participants had poor knowledge with a proportion of 56.5%, and majority of the participants had high stigma with a proportion of 55.7%. 54% of the participants practice one to three acts of discrimination, while only 5% claim to not practice any of these acts at all. This figure shows how the knowledge varied with profession, with 83.9% of doctors and 17.9% of minor staff having good knowledge on HIV, which was an obvious trend. This was a significant association too. 
This shows how stigma varies with profession. And here again, we see an obvious trend with doctors having the least stigma, with 64.5% fall into the category of low, while minor staff had the most stigma out of the three professions. This was a significant association too. This shows how the number of acts of discrimination varies with the profession. And interestingly, here there is no obvious trend unlike knowledge and stigma. However, we can appreciate that 32.3% of doctors claim that they do not practice any act, while only less than 7% from each of the other two professions claim that they do the same. This was another significant association. Then we come to the discussion of this research. The association of profession and knowledge was statistically significant, and this was an expected finding, as we expect doctors to have a higher understanding about the disease over into their years of undergraduate as well as postgraduate training in some. Thus, they are well informed of the latest updates of the disease compared to minor staff and nurses who aren't. A study conducted by Vaishali in 2006 showed a similar trend. Then we saw a significant association between profession and stigma, as well as profession and discrimination. These findings too mirror a similar study conducted by Harapan in 2013 in an Indonesian hospital. There was also a significant association between knowledge and stigma, as well as knowledge and discrimination. This could have been due to underawareness about the modes of transmission, which causes them to think negatively about the way HIV patients got that disease, and this leads to unnecessary stigma. Also, this leads to irrational fear, like I said before, and this causes them to provide a different form of care, thus leading to discrimination. A similar finding was seen in a study conducted by Suk in 2020 in Gaul. There was a significant association between prior education and knowledge as well. The associations that were not significant were between stigma and discrimination, and also between discrimination and the reason of fear of lack of post-exposure prophylaxis. So in conclusion, our study revealed that with increasing level of profession, the knowledge was high, stigma was low, and also discrimination was low. In addition, to the lack of knowledge, the lack of knowledge led to high levels of both stigma and discrimination. Previous education on HIV made participants more knowledgeable on the disease. And finally, there was no relationship between stigma and discrimination. At the end of our study, we were able to come up with recommendations for the problems that we have identified. So the major problem was a lack of knowledge among healthcare workers, which led to unnecessary stigma and discrimination. Hence, we suggest the implementation of in-service workshops and other educational programs for them to raise awareness about the modes of transmission. Not only will this remove any myths and misconceptions about the disease, but also provide them with a chance to clarify any doubts they have about the disease. Furthermore, the general public must be aimed at, as we can extrapolate from our findings to say that a deficit in knowledge within the healthcare setting would mean a greater deficit in knowledge among laymen too. Hence, we need to make use of mass media and public campaigns to further educate the public in order to reduce stigma and discrimination towards HIV patients. To decide on a mode of intervention for healthcare workers, we could do a survey among them and find out their preferred choice of intervention, thus more effectively delivering the message through that method. Another important recommendation is to conduct a similar study at other hospitals too. By doing so, we can generalize the study findings and carry all these interventions at a broad geographical scale. These were a few limitations of our study. We had a compromised sample size of 120 and also was unable to carry out the study in other hospitals due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Also, the questionnaires were self-administered Hence, there could have been instances where a participant may answer in a way more morally correct despite having a history of discriminating an HIV patient. These are some of the references that were used from other studies. And finally, let me make this a moment to express our incomparable appreciation to our supervisors, Dr. Amali Dal Patadu and Professor Ainjadar Balasuria for guiding us throughout our study. And we are also grateful to the Deputy Director of District General Hospital Kalutere and thankful to each and every participant who took part in our study to make it a success. So our study was fruitful as we were able to prove a deficit in knowledge regarding HIV and AIDS and the existence of stigma and discrimination within the healthcare community. And we believe that as Sri Lanka has a low HIV prevalence and a very organized infrastructure for HIV diagnosis and treatment, if the necessary interventions to address this issue are carried out on time, that we would it would enable all of us as a nation to achieve the targets set forth by the National STD and AIDS Control Program to end HIV and AIDS by the year 2025. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for Amartya for your interesting presentation. Thank you. Uh, so uh, now the session is open for the discussion.
and uh, uh, i would like to congratulate you for conducting a, a study like that but i am asking you what is your what what did you feel when you were conducting this what was your difficulty index was it like uh, sailing a rough sea uncharted rough sea or was it smooth uh, sailing what was your personal view personally uh, it was not as smooth sail it was more like uh, it was in the middle of the covid 19 pandemic firstly and also we had to uh, once we approach the patients we had to first explain the topic about it shall we since it is a sensitive topic we had to make sure that the patient's confidentiality is preserved and without breaking that confidential we had to reassure them that none of these responses will be shared among anyone and we had to make sure that anonymity was completely preserved throughout the research and that was uh, we had to reassure, reassure them a couple of times before handing over the consent form and even before handing over the questionnaire so that good was work. a challenge good work thank you thank you sir did you uh, i'm professor viratna did you use a, a particular uh, scale uh, to assess stigma and discrimination or did you just ask some questions uh, actually madam we referred to literature done on this topic and then we found a couple of scales so what we did was some of these questions we thought were not culturally appropriate so what we did was we used that scale along with another set of questions and we pre-tested it among 20 participants before uh, doing it in our setting. So from our pre-testing, we found out that some questions with the page, the respondents did not, they left out or they left, they didn't respond it. So because of that, we removed those questions which were, we thought were not culturally appropriate to Sri Lanka. For example, like certain questions regarding sexual intercourse and some uh, male-to-male sex transmission, some of them Uh, were left out, so we targeted only the questions that had a good response in pre-testing. Okay, uh, you might like to mention that uh, the two scales and uh, that the items were adopted and adapted from these two scales. Okay, thank yes, you. Sir. Thank you, madam. I would like to also chip in. I think uh, the question I was going to ask Professor Senivaratna already asked. Now, in yes, your sir. area, it is much easier. That is, how do you set the benchmark or the gold standard for behavior? What is considered discrimination? What is considered good or bad? I think uh, I asked the same regarding COVID. But in all these areas, I am very interested in developing how this benchmark is set. So you answered it partly. And you said, for example, that Uh, culturally inappropriate things like uh, what did you say it's referring to sexual practice or uh, yes, whatever sir. is that uh, you remote so are these decisions rather arbitrary how are they standardized you know how is it that who are the 20 who decide that this is the right answer uh sir we did the pre-testing at uh, uskdu and they are again similar like we resembled our sample uh, from there there were nurses who took part as well as doctors so we gave certain questions like we assess certain acts of discrimination in our questionnaire so by the responses that we got uh, we were able to establish a huge proportion of our participants that did not respond to certain question we felt like it is better to remove them and proceed rather than including them in the main study set thank you thank you thank That's you sir answer thank you Have you got any other questions or comments? Okay, in the absence of further questions, uh, we'll move on to the last presentation of uh, session three, that is knowledge on COVID-19 among healthcare support personnel in a tertiary care hospital in Colombo, Sri Lanka. by T.S. Disanayaka, D. Dolka, M. Arish, and M. M. P. T. Jaisekara. The presenting author is T.S. Disanayaka. Today, my presentation is about our research study on knowledge on COVID-19 among healthcare support personnel in a tertiary care hospital in Colombo, Sri Lanka. So 
So year 2020-20 has been a very challenging year for the global health because of the pandemic. So the healthcare workers are more vulnerable to the disease because the nature of their work during the pandemic situation. So healthcare support personnel are an important subgroup of the healthcare workers, which includes and not limited to uh, the healthcare assistants, uh, who, are, who are the laborers, uh, the ward attendants, the ambulance drivers, and cleaners. So why healthcare support personnel? So even from the beginning of the pandemic, there has been a vast, uh, vast uh, area of medical literature that has been published, understanding the knowledge, attitudes and practices of doctors and nurses. But there has been uh, barely any uh, research work that has been done solely concentrating on the knowledge, attitudes and practices of the healthcare support person. So on the other hand, uh, the pre-pandemic studies suggest that their inadequate knowledge uh, affects, uh, directly affects the attitudes and practices, which ultimately leads to poor infection control practices, increased intrahospital transmission, self-exposure, and so on. So it's important to study their level of knowledge uh, during the period of this pandemic. So the objective of our study was to and uh, understand the COVID-19 related knowledge and associated factors of the healthcare support personnel. So it also allows this rare opportunity for them to self-express their knowledge and so that we can understand their level of knowledge and the gaps in the knowledge. So the study would be ultimately in, uh, valuable to the uh, hospitals as well as the policy makers. So the methodology of the study is a description, descriptive cross-sectional study uh, which was done at the Colombo South Teaching Hospital in Kalubovila during the during September to December of 2020. So about the sampling, uh, so firstly we needed to find the total population of the healthcare support personnel at uh, CSTG, CSTH. So for that we used the Sri Lanka Essential Health Services Package 2019, which was published by the Ministry of Health. So uh, then we used the Cochran sam sampling techniques for that finite population, which was 58,190, and we obtained the sample size, which is 382. So we, for the study, we included the board attendants, healthcare assistants, the laborers, the cleaners, and the ambulance drivers. So the administrative support staff was excluded because of the lack of direct uh, patient interaction of them. Uh, so uh, the data collection method was uh, using interview administrated questionnaire and that questionnaire contained seven knowledge questions. So based on the two and four answers given for each question, we gave them a, a specific score and converted into a percentage. So then we found the uh, median of the uh, values, which was 80%. So those who scored above the median were regarded to have a good knowledge, whereas those who had less was regarded to have a poor knowledge. So starting off the results with the social demographic backgrounds. Uh, so uh, firstly, I'd like to describe the age distribution of the uh, sample. So uh, the majority of the participants were between 21 to 60 years. So only 1% of the population were above 60 years. And uh, the majority of the participants belong to uh, 31 to 40 uh, year category. So about the educational level of the participants, uh, nine, the majority, that is 94.78% uh, of the participants had the educational level of GCE O level or higher, but none of them had any uh, college level or university education. And 0.52% uh, uh, percentage of the participant, participants claimed that they did not have any formal education. About the work experience of the uh, uh, sample, uh, almost all of them were experienced. That means they had any work experience a minimum of one year. And uh, uh, majority, that is 31.59% uh, of the participants had a work experience between 11 to 20 years. So in order to understand the impact of their knowledge to the other factors, we investigated their knowledge level against different parameters. And these includes their age, years of experience, occupation, and so on. 
So let's go one by one about uh, on the, of the associations. So firstly, uh, the associations between the respondents' knowledge and their age. So we found a significant association with a p-value of 0 0.017, 0 0.017. And uh, uh, what we found was the youngest group, which is the age category of 21 to 30, uh, had a very good, uh, had a highest level of good, uh, level of participants with good knowledge. And that level was uh, declining uh, with the advancing of the age. So that declining was gradual up to the uh, age of, age category of 51 to 60 and uh, thereafter the declining of the knowledge level was drastic. Next we found another association between their knowledge and the year of services. So to understand that we uh, divided the total population, total participants into two for those who had uh, working experience more than 10 years and those who are having working experience less than 10 years. The majority, that is 56% of them, were, uh, the uh, majority of those who had a working experience of 10 years or less was having a good knowledge, while the majority of those who were having a work experience of more than 10 years were having a poor knowledge. The next, uh, the next association we found was between their knowledge and the, their highest level of education. Uh, so their knowledge level was significantly improving their increasing knowledge. So in the graph, you can see the blue part is the proportion of the poor participants with the poor knowledge and the green part is, is the participants with the, uh, with the good knowledge. So uh, as you can see, the first column, uh, that's below all level column, so the majority of the population were, uh, study group was having a, uh, poor knowledge compared to the small uh, proportion of good knowledge, but that was uh, significantly improving with the with their increasing level of knowledge, level of the highest level of education. So next, uh, since the healthcare support assistant, uh, healthcare support personnel is an umbrella term which includes different uh, occupations, we try to understand the variability of knowledge uh, based on their specific type of occupation. So again, we found a significant finding with a p-value of 0 0.025. Uh, and that was uh, almost all the occupations were having a fairly similar levels of uh, good knowledge except for the cleaners. So for cleaners, if you can see again in the graph, uh, only 20% of them were having a good knowledge and 80% of them were having a uh, poor knowledge. So this, this was significantly different from the uh, other professions. So next, uh, the association between their knowledge and the fear of COVID. Uh, so regardless of the level of knowledge of the uh, uh, the level of knowledge, the majority claimed that they were not feared of COVID-19. But the majority of those who claimed not fear were having a good knowledge. So uh, that depicts that those who had a better knowledge uh, were less fear of the COVID-19 uh, uh, and uh, so less fear to perform their duties. So that's an important finding. So out of the associations we checked, the following, uh, out of the following, we couldn't find any uh, so significant associations. So the, uh, this includes different parameters of uh, the attitudes. So I'd like to come to the conclusion. Uh, the most of the respondents were having a satisfactory knowledge, level of knowledge despite of su subtle variations with the occupation and uh, so on. Uh, uh, that uh, satisfactory level of knowledge was there for everyone except for the cleaners. And also, yeah, also uh, it's, it's important to uh, have a structured training program for them to improve their knowledge. And uh, also on such training programs, we should uh, include a part of the knowledge of knowledge of the COVID-19 as well, which would uh, increase the adherence to their precautions, which are ultimately protecting themselves and on the mitigating on mitigating the pandemic. And also on such training programs, special attention should be given to those who are aged about 40 and those who are having more than 10 years of experience and those who are having an educational level less than uh, GCE or less. The references. And I'd like to thank all the healthcare support staff who participated in the study and the director of the Columbus South Teaching Hospital. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Nisanak, for your interesting presentation. So now uh, this is open for discussion. Well, I'm waiting to see whether someone else will ask a question before I ask it. But uh, I want to ask, uh, I, I think uh, many community health specialists are also here. In a study like this, which is purely looking at mostly descriptive information, uh, can you, I, I will ask you, and then someone else might come to your support or is, uh, is it necessary to do a sample calculation in the manner you mentioned? So we needed to find the, uh, in order to find the adequacy uh, of the amount, uh, amount of subjects needed, we need to calculate the sample size. So for that, we use the Cochran technique, uh, the sampling method. You needed a certain sample size to prove what you were testing a specific hypothesis. It didn't sound like it from your description. You know, to, because uh, you, your sample size uh, calculation uh, using the Cochrane thing and all seemed a little uh, complex around for me. But I, I'm asking, is that uh, essential prerequisite for a study like yours? Were you told that it is necessary to do that? Would Professor Rohini or someone? Yeah, uh, uh, Co Cochrane formula is not all that complex and arrogant, though it looks so. Uh, it, it's done by a former professor from Harvard University on statistics. Uh, and this is the simple formula we use in prevalence estimates of P, Z alpha squared P into Q divided by the precision. And that is done, P is for prevalence, so that you have an adequate sample size uh, to estimate prevalences. So if the study looks at uh, certain categories of uh, practices, uh, certain categories with good or bad knowledge, uh, that might be useful to ensure that we have, that's how we have ended up with 382, taking 50% uh, as P. Uh, so that, uh, that is uh, usually 382 is the sample for P of uh, less than 0 0.5, P uh, less than 0 0.5. That is to establish a prevalence, isn't it? Yes, P, that is the P, P to Q. Yes, so now if in a study, I want to establish certain practices, uh, related to doing something or related to uh, a, a percentage of people with some kind of attribute or characteristic uh, or a behavior or, or even knowledge, uh, you might use that. But in that case, uh, we would <laughs> perhaps look at different uh, available data and take the highest sample size. So there is a certain amount of rationale and thinking behind it, but this uh, probably, I, I think this might be an undergraduate research, I'm not sure, uh, in which case actually we don't expect them to do that also because of the time limitations, uh, etc. So that's um, uh, I can uh, tell you, and if you look at Luanga and Luanga, the book that is published on sample sizes that are already calculated for different levels, uh, it will also give 382% where you expect at least P percentage of 50% to have a good level of knowledge or something like that. So that, that is actually a very simple basis for that. I, I hope that was clear, but uh, for students, we usually don't expect them to study 300, 400, et cetera also, simply because of uh, time limitations and they do it in the middle of doing the other clinical work, et cetera, on a Thursday afternoon only once a week. I mean, you had already decided that you will do the study on healthcare workers in the Colombo South Hospital, isn't it? So you, even if the cal sample size calculation came wrong, then you would have had to expand the study to some other institution. Uh, uh, what, let him answer. Okay. I'm also part of that study. I just, I actually listened to Rohini Mendes' explanation. This was actually done through knowledge, attitude and practices. Knowledge part was the only one that was analyzed the, by the time. And it's a comparative study with Sri Lanka and Bhutan. So because of that, we want that 
scientific uh, calculation. That's the only reason we took that sample size calculation. Okay. Thank you. And uh, I would like to say that whenever you want to evaluate knowledge uh, in a situation like this, now knowledge has factual knowledge, then the conceptual knowledge, and the people who have gone through the experience, hands-on experience, and they have applied knowledge. So which sort of knowledge you have sort of emphatically uh, sort of given to them, checked? Because anyone can have factual knowledge. You can read and read and read, listen, listen, and you can increase uh, your factual knowledge. And then the person who has gone through it, experienced this, has a different type of knowledge. So what sort of knowledge you are mainly concentrating? Uh, so since uh, basically we were checking the knowledge of the healthcare support personnel, we, che uh, we check their basic level of knowledge based on the uh, knowledge that they can gather from the public media and also that includes yeah, the... Combination, the combination, yes. All right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank Please. you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, it seems that uh, time has come to conclude the third session of IRC, uh, Faculty of Medicine, IRC, KDU. And in summary, this session covered timely topics related to knowledge, attitude, and practice on home injuries, COVID-19, HIV, and thalassemia. And it is really great to witness scientific findings of many good researchers. And first of all, I would like to thank our two judges today, Professor Aryarani Anandasan, Professor Asita Di Silva, for accepting our invitation and uh, invitation amidst your busy work. Then a uh, special thank goes to all the senior professors for your valuable comments and constant encouragement even through your experiences. And I would like to thank all the presenters for their clear presentation and adhering to the given time and putting hard work into practice. And also a big thank to organizing committee for uh, clear audio-visual support and facilitating all the presenters. Then uh, finally, I would like to thank my co-chair, Dr. Indika Mudirige. Also, uh, I would like to wish all of the participants a good luck in your future endeavors. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of the third technical session, which was very interesting and attractive. On behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to thank Dr. Indika Mudalige and Dr. Nayana Fernando for chairing this session. And the two eminent judges, Vidya Jyoti, Professor Asita De Silva, and Professor Arya Rani Naradasan, for being kind enough to accept our invitation to judge this session. With this, we conclude the third technical session of the 14th International Research Conference of General Sir John Kotalawala Defense University. <laughs>